Uh, good morning, and uh, may I welcome everyone to the sixth meeting of the Citizens Participation and Public Petitions Committee of 2022. Um, we have got a busy agenda this morning, and we start with a declaration of interests. Um, since we last met, uh, Ruth McGuire has left the committee. I'd very much like to thank Ruth for the work that she did with us in the short time that she was with us. Uh, and wish her well in the committee to which I understand she has now progressed. But uh, we are delighted in her place to welcome uh, Fergus Ewing, MSP, who, to the committee. Welcome to you, Fergus. And in the time-honoured tradition with which I'm sure you are familiar, the floor is yours while we now invite you to uh, just speak to a declaration of any interests that might be relevant to the committee. That's a bit of a risky invitation, Convener, but I'll suffice to say I'm delighted to join this committee, which I've always admired as a hallmark of the Scottish Parliament and a distinctive asset that we have in allowing access to citizens to our Parliament. So I'm very pleased to play a part um, working across party in a non-partisan fashion on this committee. And the interest I would declare is that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland. I'm on the role of solicitors, but haven't practised in many a moon. Thank you very much. <clears throat> that brings us to item two this morning, uh, which is a, an evidence session. Uh, and we are taking evidence this morning from a Scottish Government expert group. Uh, and the evidence is from the Scottish Government's Working Group on Institutionalising Participatory and Deliberative Democracy Group. Uh, which I'll refer to as the, well, apparently I'm going to refer to as the IPDD <laughs> group from now on. Uh, it was established last summer and it published a report in March of this year, uh, which set out a number of recommendations on how to make Scotland's democracy more participative and inclusive. And of course, that's very relevant to the uh, consideration that the committee is currently uh, giving to this whole area as part of our uh, remit. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, three uh, members of the committee to our proceedings this morning. Here with us in the uh, Parliament is Kelly McBride, who is Deliberative Democracy Lead with TPX Impact. Uh, and it says here appearing in person, but uh, there you are, so, <laughs> self-evidently so. And I'm delighted that we also have joining us online this morning Fiona Garvin, Director of the Scottish Community Development Centre. Uh, and also joining us is Talat Yakub, who's the independent consultant and researcher appearing virtually. Well, welcome to you all. And I understand, Kelly, that you've offered to uh, determine as we progress through our evidence and inquiry this morning, who's best placed to answer each of our, our questions. Uh, and for those of you participating virtually, uh, so that the clerks are aware uh, that you would like to come in, if you want to come in spontaneously at any point, then just as in every other medium, if you could put an R in the chat box, that would let us know that you wish to come in. And we have a, a, a number of areas that we're keen to explore with the group this morning. Um, and these follow on, I think, very much from our first evidence session that we took with uh, uh, witnesses who were really from a very broad spectrum, both internationally and here in the UK, with an expertise in this area. So I think we want to look at the operation of the group, um, the definitions that you have identified, uh, the benefits of participatory and deliberative democracy. And I think I note um, that there is a section which talks about the risks and I, and I guess we are in this committee also keen to understand what the unforeseen consequences might be of even being successful <laughs> in a deliberative democracy exercise. Um, although some of the risks appear to be identified as a, risks that come about if we don't succeed well enough, but I mean, I think there, there could be others too. The group's vision, um, the recommendations that you've made and obviously the next steps, because uh, we, as I know you will be now, are looking forward to receiving at some point the Scottish Government's response. And I think probably we we'll maybe want also just to have some idea the extent to which um, the Scottish Government left the committee to do its own work or to what extent um, you, you felt you were getting encouraged um, to sort of look at particular areas which might then lead you to anticipate the nature of the response you might receive. So if, if I could just start off, um, Kelly, by asking really how the membership, or insofar as you're aware, how the membership of this group was established. And as I said a moment ago, just to what extent 
uh, Scottish Government officials had any input into the kind of thinking as it developed within, uh, within the committee once established? Yes, of course. So, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly McBride, as you heard. I'm Lib Tiv Democracy Lead at TPX Impact. And I think it's helpful to share that my role in the working group was facilitating uh, the sessions. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them in the moment. So the working group itself brought together a range of members from civil society, academia and research, independent expertise, practitioners, and at points invited some inputs from people representing uh, the civil service, the Scottish government, local government, the Scottish parliament, and indeed the secretariat of Scotland's climate assembly. And I think it was really important to hear some different perspectives uh, for members of the group that represented a really broad range of people um, with interest in this area and great experience and knowledge uh, to help us think through some of the challenges of institution institutionalising participatory and deliberative democracy. Um, and I know uh, other colleagues joining us on the call might want to give their perspective of the range of views and experience that were in the room in a moment, but I thought it'd be helpful just to give a bit of background to uh, how the group operated and how it is that we came together in our meetings. So. In essence, uh, we had five facilitated workshops between July and November 2022. By facilitated, I mean that the group came together in what I understand as a format that's not typical of a working group in that we really wanted to encourage uh, deep interrogation of ideas for everyone to be able to share their different perspectives. And so we gave great thought, or I gave great thought, to the format in which those meetings were conducted, which were a series of uh, small group discussions, but also plenary discussions um, with invited input from people representing different parts of the system that I mentioned a moment ago. So the workshops themselves between July and November covered a series of topics. The first one looked at context setting and background. So we were really at a starting point there of thinking, you know, what does participation and participatory democracy mean to us? What does it mean to embed or have more routine use of this? And where has this group come from? So we learnt a little bit about uh, how the group was instigated, about some of the things included in things like the Butte House Agreement and the Programme for Government and recent conversations that had happened uh, across um, the, the sphere in Scotland. In the second workshop, we looked at standards, values and principles. There, we used the uh, OECD's um, uh, uh, work as a starting point to interrogate some of the standards, values and principles and um, thought about what that meant in the context of Scotland and, you know, how would these things work in Scotland. In the third workshop, we looked at the remit, governments and impact. In the fourth, resources and infrastructure. And in the final one, we had a review session to look at basically how the report was developing. And the final thing that I'll just say at this point to give a bit of background is that we gave opportunities for people to review the raw notes that were captured during all of those sessions to continue providing feedback and input asynchronously. So that means they had time to reflect on what was coming out of these sessions and give further feedback. And there were also opportunities at two points to comment on emerging draft reports and make suggested uh, amendments and edits to those reports, including spotting any gaps or issues of contention that we brought back to the group to discuss during those various sessions, but in particularly in that final review workshop. Um, in terms of the membership of the group, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not too sure in how everyone was brought into the fold, but I can absolutely say with certainty that the membership of that group are people that have uh, experience from the broad range of different sectors and perspectives that I mentioned, um, and definitely brought different perspectives. So it wasn't a consensus, you know, throughout on every single point, there was absolutely discussion. Um, but I would invite other colleagues to maybe give a reflection as participants in that process um, and how they experience and tell that maybe you'll be well placed. To, to do that. Fiona, would you like to, Fiona, sorry, would you like to come in on that? Yes, I, I mean, what might seem like an obvious gap in a membership of the group are citizens themselves, or people who have been through an assembly process, of which we've had two in Scotland. But I believe there were some constraints around that, just in terms of the delay of being able to provide support, follow-up support to the citizens that were involved in the Citizens' Assembly for Scotland and, and, and the, the Climate Assembly. Um, I think in future years that getting that citizen perspective into how this work develops in Scotland is critically important, but I think that is something that we will achieve as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and I don't know, I mean, uh, Talat, is there anything you would like to contribute on this particular kind of construction? 
Uh, no, just to endorse what Fiona said there in that um, going forward, the implementation of this, the delivery of this, and that being led by the very participants and citizens we want involved, those who are furthest marginalised from access to, to power and influence, is, is critical because this was um, a combination of people who were independent and thought differently of it, but were experts and at least in some way had some access to influence and had been involved in these kinds of work groups before. So but pursuing that in the delivery would be helpful. Well, th that might actually sort of anticipate what I was going to ask now, because I understand from everything you've said how the workshops were constructed. And I was just interested to know how the actual recommendations themselves emerged. Um, how did how did they surface? I mean, and and then how and how did you come to agree what those recommendations would be? Sorry, it should be the. the right. Um, so there are uh, two things that I'll say around this. So firstly, um, during the workshops themselves, there were a series of prompt questions that during the discussion enabled us to, uh, I think, surface the range of possible options, which were then able to be what we call synthesised. That means, you know, one group may have said the same thing, another group said the others, we would bring them together and then present the range of different ideas that had come up back to the group and have further discussion that enabled us to basically narrow down um, preferred options. So within the workshop settings, we were able to do that. And again, uh, I mentioned, you know, there was there was feedback that happened asynchronously, which also enables us to surface where there was still further discussion to be had and, and some tensions perhaps playing out with different ideas. And those ideas were again brought back to the final workshop and the members of the group were giving further opportunities to, to make comments. And then we were able to, you know, to bring that back and provide further opportunities opportunities if people did want to discuss different options and different routes. I think um, just building on what Tala and Fiona said there about the citizen voice, I think the group were very um, conscious of the fact that actually some of the recommendations that could potentially be made did require further discussion and that was why there is very intentionally uh, recommendations to engage in further discussion and the recommendations themselves don't stray too far into the design of these different processes and systems and that again you know that is intentional because the group um, realized that actually it would be preferable to involve more people in that conversation so I would highlight in in particular two two recommendations the one related um, to the children and young people's symposium uh, we did not have representatives of youth organisations or designated youth representatives on this group and we saw um, both an opportunity but also you know a risk of this group making recommendations when actually you haven't involved the voices of the people that this was going to impact and an opportunity of being able to have what we believe knowing some of the work that our wonderful youth organisations across Scotland are doing at the moment to bring them together actually to have a discussion about how they want to see that side of things progressing and uh, another area um, and this also relates to uh, why the kind of the vision the standards and the other bits are in a supporting document was that we were really aware that there needed to be um, some further and deeper engagement with local government and the group was very conscious that the local and community aspect of this is something that needed much more conversation and it needed to ensure that we had stakeholders in the room that were able to represent the breadth of local views so there are recommend there's a recommendation there for further engagement on the local issue because the group is again very conscious uh, that that local element is a huge part really about how we institution, institutionalize participatory and deliberative democracy even though we were given a set remit at the start to focus particularly on citizens assemblies uh, from one particular angle um, but we opened up that conversation very purposefully in order to leave the space to invite stakeholders to engage more deeply on this um, over the coming months we would hope Thank you. And at the consumer profession we are, you could have anticipated just where I was going to go <laughs> there with my, with my next question, because I was interested to know why the standards documents uh, stood to one side. And it's a theme that's broadly similar to the one you just articulated in relation to some of the recommendations. And uh, we probably mm. will touch on uh, some of the groups, particularly you referred there to, to the young people to go along. I think that's kind of set the scene in terms of how the group operated, um, how the recommendations arose and what you thought the, not the limits of the recommendations, but the limits of the force behind the recommendations that you might have had, because like I think as we've discovered in even our own consideration, there are many voices really to be considered in all of this. And whilst it may well be fortuitous if they come to similar views, 
uh, we want to see if that's actually what happens rather than necessarily uh, insisting that it be the case. Um, if we move now to the definitions, David Torrance, would you like to take us forward with those? Because they're very interesting. Okay, thank you very much, convener, and good morning to all the witnesses. Um, the first objectives of the group was to come up with definitions. How did you come about yeah, so um, the first step of this was an open invitation to the group to share definitions that they used in their everyday work, and they were collated essentially in a document. And then a smaller group were brought together to review some of the definitions, and we particularly, I would highlight, had input from academics who have worked to try and define some of this terminology and literature and the work that they're doing, uh, who again were representative on the group. Um, and there was just a process of reviewing some of the, uh, the definition options, refining them, and um, again, having a check and a sense check with the wider group to see that they were happy with them. So the initial list really was drawn um, from our academic uh, partners in the group, um, but others brought their experience and were able to, to tweak the language that was ultimately included in the final report. And there are references um, in the document itself which uh, have some direct links to where some of the sources for the starting points for many of those definitions are. Can you go into more detail why definitions is not definitive? Why definitions is not? Yes, indeed. So um, I think there is some uh, contestation, as you find in many parts of academia in particular, uh, who have done a really good job, I think, of trying to define what is some, you know, started as quite a tricky concept to define. Um, so there is no, I would say, uh, consensus in the literature to say this is the ultimate definition. And I don't think that's a bad thing in the context of this work, because we were dealing with democracy and we understand that in different contexts, people may want Want to have some room to kind of manoeuvre and define things in a way that work for them in their setting. And indeed, I'd say in, in previous work that's happened in Scotland, uh, there has been work, for example, around the participation framework that is uh, mentioned in the Open Government Action Plan uh, most recently, that, you know, there is no consensus over the one kind of form of uh, how to frame the language around all of these things. And we're finding different actors and different partners are using um, different language. And that is, I believe, you know, one of the reasons why a task of trying to define this in the context of this work was set for the group because it would acknowledge that there isn't kind of one set and agreed definition across all actors and indeed internationally that's used as best practice uh, if that makes sense. And I, think, I think Talat would like to come in on this one as well uh, David. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nir. Um, so just, just to add to that, that point, one of the reasons why the group membership was so varied, so you had people from civil society, third sector, academics, researchers, was to be able to have wide ranging definitions. So, for example, um, all the work that I've done on this is direct engagement, is participation, it's working with communities. The definitions used there are really focused on accessibility and ease compared to some of the definitions that might be used in academia. So actually having that space to come together and put definitions that people who are working on the, these issues from, a, from very different perspectives are able to come together and get some consensus on was hugely beneficial. There is a fluidity involved in this because some of the definitions depend on the type of deliberative democracy methods that are then pursued. And, and I think um, whilst there might be it might be difficult not to have definitions that are, are, are uh, very clear and straight cut. This isn't clear and straight cut. In fact, it goes in the direction that the citizens and the participants are looking for. So there needs to be some element of fluidity there. But the definitions were created and, and the consensus was built from individuals that have come together with years and years of expertise, but from very different backgrounds. And, and that's why that exercise was really, really helpful in, um, in creating basically the, the, the base, the foundations of this report, um, because it allowed us to think about the way in which we have been delivering participation in our different arenas in public life. David Torrance. Um, around the benefits, what evidence is there to show that these benefits, the list of benefits you came to, how, how did you come to them? 
Yes, and again, I, I will turn to uh, Fiona and Talat to give a response to this. Um, but again, just building on what Talat was saying there, I think a, a range of benefits were brought from different partners that were involved in this. So when you look at the report, you would see that they have been organised, drawing on all of that experience into categories of benefits for people and communities, benefits for, for government, specific benefits for children and young people. And there was some further engagement as well, I would, should say, uh, around children and young people um, with some... Uh, different actors out in, in civil society and youth organisations to talk about that specifically. Um, but Tala and Fiona, can I bring you in on this point to speak to the benefits? Perhaps uh, Fiona first, then Tala. Okay, um, there's, um, it's a shame that Oliver isn't here to be able to, to, to give evidence this morning due to family bereavement, but certainly in terms of the research support of the Citizens Assembly for Scotland, some of the benefits as expressed by participants, citizens themselves, are, are within that report. I was one of the facilitators of the Citizens' Assembly for Scotland, and certainly that we had continual conversations about people's um, you know, participation and how it benefited them individually and how they could then see how it could benefit wider society. Um, we also, along with the Democratic Society, supported a group of the, the citizens who took part in the Citizens' Assembly for Scotland as part of a follow-up support, because those individuals wanted to continue to engage in democratic processes. They wanted to advocate for citizens' assemblies and better participatory democracy in Scotland as a foundation of, of our democracy and how it works. So a lot of the, the, the benefits that you see there are, are, are things that have been expressed by citizens them, themselves, as well as research on citizens' assemblies, both here in Scotland, UK, and further afield. Thank you. And Talat? Yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure if, I'm, I'm, if that was my cue to come in. Um, yes, yeah, certainly, um, I completely endorse what both Kelly and Fiona have said there. Um, Again, it is evidence-based. The, the benefits that have been explained are from citizens themselves, from participation efforts, and also from academic research. Um, and it's really important that some of the benefits are put into the context of the current political landscape as well, where there is a decreasing trust within political processes, within democracy. And actually, one of the clear benefits of this is um, if implemented well, is regaining some of that trust, opening access to decision making to a much wider group of people and creating um, participation and a sense of ownership over the decisions that are impacting um, our daily lives, particularly those from communities who are the most marginalised. So there is very clear benefits and, and from my perspective, the benefits very clearly outweigh the risks both for the individuals in terms of citizens, for communities, for local government, all the way through to parliament and government, there is there are a range of benefits, and these are um, expressed both in evidence um, from uh, expertise and also lived experience evidence gathered through participation methods from lived experience panels, citizens assemblies, and further. If the group was looking at the benefits. Um, they must have looked at the risks to participatory democracy. So, what are the risks, please? I, I'd say one of the key risks, and again, I'll go to Talat and Fiona in the moment, um, that we started talking about uh, was the risk of doing this badly. So badly, I guess what we, we mean by that is, for example, setting really unclear expectations, um, failing to take approaches that are inclusive and um, take account of some of the equalities considerations that we have to give, uh, processes that involve people, and then nothing happens at the end. And it's unclear perhaps where their time and contribution uh, has really enabled change or seen any action off the back of it. And that's very much why we also were giving consideration in this group to, well, what are the resources that we need to do this well? How do we um, bring people together to think about what happens next after people have given their time and their contributions? And what does it mean, perhaps, to bring different actors together to think about the best way of governing processes like this so that they have trust uh, and a view of legitimacy and buy-in from the wider public? There are other risks of uh, participation like this that we talked about, such as um, perhaps things happening at you know, such a, a small scale that there isn't kind of public awareness of things that are happening. We know that media buy-in um, and you know, kind of mass media messaging around this kind of work has been quite 
difficult uh, to this point, and that's partly, you know, because this, we know this is such a new way of working, and there's a lot of learning that we as a society and across the system have to do to understand these methods and where they are best placed and how they are best placed. Um, we also talked uh, briefly about the, the risks of um, kind of having things happening in kind of one level of governance, but actually not involving other levels and layers of governance, including um, what happens at the community and the local level. So one of the things that the group very early identified that was that although we'd been brought together to talk primarily around uh, citizens' assemblies at one method, and we were talking about it at a particular level, uh, and that was, you know, delivery essentially at the kind of central level, um, actually this needs to be considered as part of a, a wider system of democracy. And I'm sure we'll come on to talk about kind of the wider system and risks uh, at some point in this discussion. So we need to think about how stuff that happens at this level connects with the real lived experience and reality that people are facing at different different levels uh, of their lives and um, that's why you know very much this group thought that you know we had to think about stuff that was happening in communities happening at the local level how that would connect to things that were happening uh, at the level in which the group was initially talking about um, and how messages and uh, that kind of learning about how this all works could be shared more widely across society so that people feel like they have the opportunity to get more involved in shaping the decisions that affect their lives and we're very conscious that this requires requires a degree of culture change uh, and, you know, a change in the way that we perhaps are working in our approach to involving people in different stages of policy processes and discussion uh, big issues that affect their lives. And that indeed is no easy task. I know some governments across the world are now looking at this in, in different ways and making attempts to embed these approaches. Um, but we're still early days in, in lots of ways. And I think we're very conscious of the fact that there's going to be a lot of learning along this journey. Um, and uh, I think we're very conscious that that means that we need lots of points of reflection built in along the way. And I think the recommendations that the group have come up with allow this to um, kind of happen at a pace that enables the moments to pause and reflect uh, and ensure that we're able to kind of adapt how we're going along the ways that we're building and uh, developing this system of participatory and deliberative democracy in a way that can be improved. Uh, and, you know, democracy itself isn't necessarily a static thing and maybe something um, that needs to be reflected on from time to time. So in terms of the risks, you know, there are there are points along the way in which we think reflection will be needed. But I'll hand over to Talat and Fiona to give a, a different take on this. Fiona, you, uh, Fiona, you particularly asked to, to come in at this point. Yeah, I don't want to repeat everything that Kelly said, but just to reinforce, um, again, the group was very clear that citizens' assemblies had to be consequential. Something had to happen as a result of it. And that's why you see in the values and principles document that, that if, if we subscribe to that set of values and principles, then whoever commissions or whoever starts the assembly has to commit to then being able to, to respond to it and respond to it publicly. I think just to expand a wee bit on Kelly's point about uh, local democracy, again, I think the group was, was really clear in saying that a citizens' assembly is only one part of a democratic infrastructure, uh, a participatory democracy infrastructure, and that actually what, uh, it has to happen throughout the system, so from communities' perspectives at local government level and, and throughout. On its own, it would have limited impact, and there is a risk that if we just ran one citizens' assembly a year, it could be seen as tokenistic if it was just you know sort of one one element that we had. Um, I think where, where we come from as, as the Scottish Community Development Centre is we work directly with communities all of the time, and what they're interested in is not just the policy issues and the bigger issues for society, but actually what impacts them in their everyday life. And so some of this work has to sit alongside what will be coming through the Local Governance Review, for example, and the review of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act, how we can start to shape democracy from the grassroots and very much at local level, as I say, where people, when they participate, have much more agency and stake in the process and also shape better outcomes, better policy, better decisions. Thank you. And Talat? Yes, thank you. Um, I think uh, I really want to emphasise that it's very clear that the benefits far outweigh any risks that are associated with pursuing deliberative democracy. In my view, I don't see risks in pursuing deliberative democracy and embedding it. The risks are, I believe, twofold. One, in, in not doing it in the current landscape or attempting to do it in an under-resourced and incadent way. So the, the, the first I want to touch on is by not pursuing uh, methods of deliberative democracy and 
opening the doors more competently to a much um, a wider and larger number of people to engage in the decisions that are impacting their lives um, is, 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 is simply not a, a, an acceptable status quo for us to um, um, be in currently. We tend to focus on consultation methods and um, uh, con consultation responses. There is some outreach that is pursued when there are big decisions being made, but this is piecemeal at best. And what I notice in a lot of the work that I've done over the years that I've been involved in um, participation work and influencing uh, consultation responses as a blunt instrument to try and get people to give your give their take on decisions that are being made, I, I don't believe are fit for purpose in the way that they are pursued currently. So I believe the risk is in not pursuing deliberative democracy to open the doors to decision making to a wider range of people. The second is it being implemented in a way that is not fit for purpose um, and is not coherent across Scottish government. Um, we risk um, delivering this without significant resource that it requires, which means that it will be something that's done when it's nice to do, not when it's necessary to do. That will give the, the feeling of tokenism for those um, on the ground, participants and citizens who actually want to take part in it and might actually do more to create distrust. So it requires very competent and well-resourced um, implementation. And the last thing I would say is the, the, the risk of, is not about doing it, but about doing it poorly. We exist in a, a society uh, with, in, with systemic inequality, with systemic oppressions, discriminations and inequalities, particularly for working class communities, for black, Asian, minority ethnic communities, disabled people, women, unpaid caterers, a number of marginalised groups. If the implementation is not embedded in an anti-oppressive, uh, a fair power redistributive um, representative model, then the risk is people who actually are at the sharpest end of policy making and feel the effects of bad policy making and decisions are the ones that are again ignored in a, in a new method of participation. But I don't think there's risks in pursuing deliberative democracy. I think there's risks in not doing it or risks in doing it purely. Can I be devil's advocate? I mean, we're not here to establish a balance sheet actually between the two, but, but let me put it just as I'm interested to understand what you would say. Um, there's, a, there's a lady who works in my local bakers, uh, who um, I, I get my, uh, my messages from, uh, to use the, the antique term. And she said to me, look, Mr. Carlo, I elect you. I have absolutely no interest in any discussion or involvement. I think very carefully about how I am going to vote. I vote for my elected representative. And if I don't like the decisions they take, then I will get rid of them. And that is how I want to operate. So I suppose one of my questions would be, is that lady being marginalised by the farming out of decision-making process to people over whom she has got no uh, democratic uh, control or mandate to determine who they are or what they're discussing or the decisions and recommendations that they're making? And, and secondly... This is a voluntary process. We, we can't mandate that people participate. And there's a very wide, we, we know it as politicians, a very wide community of uh, people who are not apathetic, but, but actually don't want to involve themselves in this whole kind of process. And I guess my question is, and I've posed this in other forums as well, if there are two communities, maybe adjacent to one another, and one is very interested in being involved in the whole deliberative democracy and consultation and comes forward with a series of recommendations. But the community in the village next there isn't. Um, but actually don't agree with a, anything that the, the, the group next door said. Have they been marginalised and would they potentially, this is the risk, would they potentially find that decisions are being arrived at and which are prejudicial to them simply because they chose not to participate in a voluntary deliberative process. So, I mean, I'm not necessarily advocating those as risks, but I'm trying to articulate what I think might be an unforeseen consequential risk of this being, in whatever sense, successful. <laughs> Kelly, I don't know if you want to yeah, have a bash at that. I was going to see if Talit wants to, to respond Talit. first, but then I'll, I'll come in. I, I can do. So um, I understand what, what you're saying here. There's, there are a few things um, I've been taking notes. 
I, I think the first and primary issue here is, you, know, you mentioned there about people being apathetic and, and they just they don't want to participate. I think it's really important to drill down and find out what it is that makes people apathetic and what is it that makes people not want to participate. So there's an issue here, not simply in saying that people don't want to participate full stop, Often it's a consequences of barriers. Often it's a consequences of not having the time to participate. Perhaps it's the consequence of not feeling that the method of participation is accessible. So there is an there. Whilst we're talking about people not feeling able to participate or being apathetic to it, I think it's more nuanced than that. And I think actually there's some drilling down on why that is. And what we find in a lot of the, the work that I do is not people not interested in the decisions that are being made, but actually they didn't see routes that were accessible for them to participate in the decisions in the first place, which is what deliberative democracy is attempting to create. And um, the second issue, this doesn't overtake representative democracy. It doesn't, it works in parallel to, works in connection with the parliament. So there is no threat to how democracy operates currently. If anything, I believe that it enhances it and makes the ability of um, parliamentarians to make decisions with evidence from a wider range of people who have experience of issues such as poverty, uh, climate change, um, whether it is um, health inequalities, whatever it might be. It actually provides input from a much wider range of people. And lastly, I would say, in, in the same token, um, we have people who don't want to uh, participate in voting. But would you be consider those people to be marginalised? There is a choice to participate in the democratic process as it currently exists. There would be a choice to participate in the democratic endeavours pursued by deliberative democracy. What we are doing is creating multiple ways of participation, be able to create as many platforms as possible for people to engage. And that creates, and the evidence tells us, that creates better, more fit for purpose decisions and, and outcomes. And so I would say that the, the person isn't marginalized because it works complementary to and alongside representative democracy. Okay, thank you. Fiona. As you just said, certainly backs up our experience of working at a local level with wider communities, community organisations as part of a wider community alliance in many different areas across Scotland. And it's, it really is around the question of what well, people often don't participate because they don't know how. And also, we, we, we find that people need both the opportunity, motivation and capacity to be able to participate. And what motivates them often is the possibility for change. Where they don't see the ability or the, 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 the consequence of them participating, then it then it can lead to people thinking, well, what's the point in doing this, if you like? And just in terms of moving to a more for, a more you know, sort of deliberative democracy, participatory democracy, what we find is that often the mechanisms for people to participate are used in hostility. And so you see that writ large across the planning system. People maybe don't participate when things are fine, but when something happens that, that you know takes out a, a transport route to school or, or there's a new housing development, people will suddenly participate. But it's in a way that's quite hostile as opposed to a process which can be embedded, which is about participation and deliberation that looks at the needs of people who need houses as well as the needs of those communities who need to keep their services intact and so on. So, from that point of view, I would agree with what has been said by Tala and Kelly about the risks are actually larger to not going down a more deliberative route and that the choices there are, are then become much wider for people to participate on their terms. But it does not negate the need for representative democracy. It sits alongside the, uh, representative democracy. And just one more thing, we have also been involved quite a lot in participatory budgeting over the years. And where we have seen in, in other countries as well as in Scotland, where local politicians get involved in participatory budgeting processes, they're out there, they're meeting voters, they're meeting, you know, sort of local local people, that they actually see the relationship develop in a positive way. And they, they, they then kind of can raise issues around, you know, sort of you know, what they know in the communities and share those with what the people are experiencing. And then we find that voter turnout actually increases as a result of people engaging in those 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 processes closer to home. Oh, thank you very much. I, mean, I, I, did, I did hope that was useful. Actually, the, 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 the issue with the, the lady I was referring to in the baker was in relation to referendums. She actually didn't want to have to be consulted in referendums because she felt she was being required to become much more knowledgeable about a subject than she felt comfortable becoming. And that was the context of, of her saying that she 
elected people to take these decisions for him. Um, Alexander Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convena, and good morning, and thank you to the panel for their comments so far. Uh, when you identified the way forward here, uh, you wanted to be ambitious, you wanted to be creative, uh, and you wanted to be inclusive. Uh, and to achieve all that, you require to have a vision. Uh, and, and that vision has come out a little bit in the discussion we've had so far this morning. But it would be quite good for you to identify how, as a group, you came about agreeing a vision uh, for this whole process. Yes, absolutely. Um, so very practically, just to, to start, and then I'll open to Fiona and Talat and then come in um, behind them, if that's OK. Um, we um, identified the different elements of a discussion that we had to have, and that was done uh, partly in that first workshop, but um, also me drawing on some of the experience of uh, lead facilitating and designing the previous citizens' assemblies that have happened in Scotland, and knowing the different areas that, for example, the research and findings had touched on as elements that perhaps needed a bit of focus and attention, for example, uh, things like the governance and those different approaches. So we essentially um, broke that down into manageable chunks so we could address each of those areas in turn. And in doing so, identified, um, as I mentioned earlier, a series of different actions that could be taken and then essentially prioritised the actions that we thought would be the most effective and most suitable in the context in which we're working and, and sought consensus from the group around those set of actions. And then we stood back and we looked at them as a whole and I mentioned that we had that final workshop to, to do that and to look at that. And at that point, we saw how the different elements and the different parts managed to fit together. And we thought about the coherence of that. And there was further opportunity to refine it asynchronously beyond that. So practically, in terms of the process, that's how we got to the different elements of the vision. But um, Fiona and Talat, do you want to make any kind of general comments uh, on the vision? Um, I can simply just add that it was um, pursued in, in a, a very similar way to how the definitions were. It was um, conversations around what it is that we expected from this when we have, um, certainly when I have, worked with um, participant citizens on the ground, um, particularly through lived experience expertise, what's their vision in terms of what they want to create, what they want created in terms of access points to um, influence decision making to have their experiences their lived experience expertise inputted into decision making in scotland so it was through that same deliberative process that we used for um, definitions and for recommendations um, and again it was leaning on the very different expertise from academia research and civil society within the working group fiona, is there anything you'd like to fiona uh, anything you'd like to add I I know I've got nothing to add. Okay. And Kelly, you wanted just to come back slightly? Yes, certainly. Um, so, I mean, I'd, I'd start by saying, you know, as a group, I think we are a group of people, and it turned out during this process, who are quite excited about the opportunity that Scotland has. Um, I mean, Scotland, uh, I know it's a bit cliche to say so, but many of us feel it's at the cutting edge of a lot of the exploration and participatory and deliberative democracy. And certainly in international settings where I have the, you know, the, the privilege of meeting people who are working on similar things, what we're doing here in Scotland and the thought that we're giving this is certainly a matter of discussion. Um, and, you know, I think the fact that we're even sitting around the table here today says a lot and that we're able to discuss this in such an open and transparent way. So I think when the, you look at the vision that's included within the document itself, it comes from that place of uh, knowing that we have something going here and that there is potential. We have wonderful uh, experiences in Scotland that are happening in pockets all over the country that we can draw on to say that there are examples of great stuff happening. And Fiona, for example, has already highlighted the work that's happening in participatory budgeting, which is particularly happening at the local level in our communities across Scotland. And we know that this work is also um, taking place in the context of many other organisations and many other uh, groups that have come together to think about this, um, talking about the potential that we have. And, uh, for example, I know that the, the group that um, Talat was involved in, the RSE um, COVID Recovery Group, in your report has also given some thought to this and made recommendations that actually we have uh, brought into our discussions and included in our report. Um, but, yeah, I, I think the group you know, drawing on the experiences um, 
that we had for the citizens' assemblies as a starting point, came to the conclusion quite early on, and I think I've already mentioned this, that although we're talking about citizens' assemblies, this is about so much more as well. And, uh, you know, we're really conscious that there is the potential, and we would hope, for this work to gain cross-party support. In fact, that's actually a really important element of this. You know, it's important that we all understand um, how participatory and deliberative democracy can develop in Scotland, and we are invested and interested in that. That as well. And um, I think the recommendations in the report themselves, you know, they... Can we go oh. to the recommendations? Oh, yeah. Because Paul's going to deal with them in a second. Alexander, is there anything you'd just like to ask? And I know Talit would like to come back in as well, but maybe if you could just see... If... Yeah, I mean, you, you, you've identified your vision and, and, and that gives you the, the starting block. You've also touched on what has happened and the lessons you've learned from the citizens' assemblies. Uh, but it's all about enhancing uh, democracy. That's your, your goal. Uh, but, but there's also a trust element here uh, as to uh, where individuals feel uh, that, that their participation is making a difference. Uh, and if that is the case, uh, is there not some potential that if that doesn't happen in all cases, that, that trust could be damaged? Uh, in, in identifying what you're trying to see in your goal and your aspiration and your vision? Yeah, well, I, know, I know Talat was keen to come in, so I don't know whether Talat had addressing the point you were going to address, but you could pick up Alexander's point as well. I, I can do. So the, the point I was going to make was just in reference to the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Post-COVID-19 Futures Commission. Um, I, I sat on that with a number of different um, experts from across uh, private sector, public sector, uh, third sector and beyond. Um, and it's not the only group that I've been on where over the last, I would say, you know, three, four years, there has been a real push to pursue deliberative democracy. So I think it's I just think it's important to emphasize that it's not just this particular working group that has this expectation within Scotland that is hoping that this is pursued well in Scotland. Um, the national participation strategy, um, expertise and um, uh, uh, an expertise centre on participation was also in the um, Royal Society of Edinburgh's report as well, uh, and in a number of other places has been discussed. And um, so it's just to emphasise that whilst this group has come together, and yes, this group came together you know, by, by the Scottish Government, it's actually being discussed in other places. So it's very timely that there is a response from the Scottish Government and this is pursued. Uh, on, on the question that was asked about trust, you're absolutely right in that if this is done in a tokenistic way, if this is not resourced well, if it's not done uh, coherently across government, yes, there absolutely is a risk that people do not trust the process um, because they, they see it as an extension of the inequalities that already exist. They may see it as an extension of um, the uh, consultation processes or some things that they already feel far away from, which is why they, we have emphasised the need for coherence, the need for good resourcing, the need for um, centres of expertise and a strategy around this to be able to ensure that whatever is implemented is implemented well and coherently to enable that trust. If this is, I genuinely believe, and the evidence suggests, if this is done well, it goes a long way to improve and repair trust between those making decisions and those feeling the impact of decisions. Um, so I, 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 what I, I understand, I understand the question, uh, and I think the question um, is really about poor implementation as opposed to um, the, the risk of deliberative democracy in itself. Okay. And, and have, finally, have you identified any areas that public participation is really not suitable for? Because that, as I've said before, the, the damage, the risk. Uh, that, that can be caused uh, by going down a route specifically. Have you seen any areas that you, that you would say you stay clear of because that could be problematic? I, I can come in there. I don't want to. Um, so uh, what, what I would say is I don't think there I can cite you any policy area which is not better enhanced by the public having a say in the decision that affects their lives. So whether that is budgeting, whether that is health, whether that is climate justice, I don't see an avenue where public participation doesn't make for better fit-for-purpose decisions and outcomes at the end. What I will say is what matters is the method of participation. Those citizens' assemblies are not necessarily the, the, the go-to method. It may be a lived experience expert group 
It may be pursuing uh, participation methods with the third sector through service users. It may be participatory budgeting, many publics. The method matters, but I would I struggle to find any example where the outcome is not improved by citizens participating well. And Fiona, you would like to comment on this as well. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think I would agree with Talat, but also just to say that I think they work best when there's a very specific focus, so that it's not a very wide question that an assembly is considering that it's, it's drilled down into a very specific theme or, or topic area. And I think there's also um, quite a lot of evidence from, from um, citizens' assemblies that have already run that actually the capability to discuss some seemingly intractable issues is within an assembly things you know that there was the, the assembly that in Ireland about abortion rights for example so from that point of view that because it's you know kind of set up the way that it's that, that those that the assemblies are with the kind of processes and values in place actually the ability to make sense of some of those trickier issues is there within them okay thank, thank you, you. And, and we'll come to the recommendations now and uh, Paul Sweeney you're going to uh, lead some questions on this Paul thank you convener um Noted that the recommendations are set out both in summary and in detail in the report um, and cover around uh, two themes, which are developing a broad range of participation and democratic innovations and using this system as a basis to establish routine use of citizens' assemblies in Scotland. So just turning to the first theme, um, there seems to be different time periods that are specified. So early foundational actions, uh, actions within the current parliament to May 2026 and longer term ambitions for consideration. So we obviously know the length of the current parliamentary session, but other time periods are perhaps not as specific. Um, so I think we can also note that there are significant asks of the Scottish Government as well that these will be required in things like uh, a unit within the Scottish Government with responsibility for participation. Um, and that seems to be a response to the objective to provide an indication of the resources necessary. Obviously, that will have to be led by government. But there are also a number of recommendations that, that engage the Parliament specifically, um, noting uh, adopting values, principles and standards for institutionalising participatory and deliberative democracy, supporting upcoming reviews and legislation to embed participation and deliber deliberation across the system, Consider the proposals of the Citizens' Assembly on the future of Scotland for new infrastructure associated with the Scottish Parliament. Collaborate with local government, public services and Parliament to establish and agree clear agenda setting guidelines for all Citizens' Assemblies and to connect to the Scottish Parliament Committee system for scrutiny of Citizens' Assembly processes and recommendations. So, Bearing in mind those specific um, recommendations that engage with Parliament, how do these different categories and time periods relate to each other and which are particularly time critical? And also in the group the group as a whole, what prioritization of recommendations took place? Are there any specific critical uh, recommendations that we should take a particular note of? So I'd just like to open up to perhaps Kelly first of all. Thank you. Kelly, are you this question? I am, yeah. I can kick this off, but I absolutely think others will have a perspective on this too. Um, so, yeah, thank you for, for laying out how the recommendations have been set out. And as you have already said, they're set out over um, some different time periods. I mean, foundationally, um, we are really conscious that this work to work well, to ensure that it has the resources behind it, requires people with the knowledge and expertise essentially driving um, the delivery of all of the different recommendations, the bringing together of the different stakeholders that are needed to make this work success. And that uh, is where I would just highlight the recommendation there around the establishment of a participation unit. And that has very much come um, from the group's sense that there is just a huge gap really in um, the responsibility to hold um, the delivery of many of these recommendations. And we think it could be a big point of failure actually if there is not a dedicated uh, set of people that are there with the responsibility um, to drive this, but also, I think, very importantly, over the longer term, to learn and to hold and ensure that we're reflecting on the lessons as this is going on. Uh, so there's like a, an evaluation and monitoring element that is built into the work of that team too, as well as um, responsibility for essentially supporting uh, the wider civil service and people tasked with making policy to really understand what this work means and to support them um, to be able to go out and to deliver it. Uh, 
uh, in other areas too. So I think I would just highlight that as a really important starting point because it is a huge gap that we've highlighted. Um, you touched on um, Parliament, and I'm aware that there are recommendations that um, don't necessarily direct the Parliament or, or local government in any particular way. And as I mentioned earlier, that was done on purpose because I think it's important to say that, um, you know, the, the group, although members of the group talked about the role of local government and, and central government and Scottish Parliament, indeed civil society and communities, um, the group had a specific remit that focused on actions that the Scottish government needs to take at this point in time. But we were really cautious, I think, to try and respect the autonomy um, that other parts of the system that I just mentioned have, but also really conscious that we need to find ways to involve them to progress this too. And again, that's why we didn't stray into things like design, but we have recommendations that leave space open for further opportunities and to essentially bring people together um, behind some of those kind of values, the standards and the principles that we've also uh, reflected in this work too. Um, so, yeah, I think ultimately, you know, the, the, the recommendations that are here touch on what is uh, an issue for Scotland more broadly and for democracy in Scotland. Uh, we know that the reality is that we're working in a, a multi-level system and we need to understand the connection between the different parts of the system. So the recommendations have attempted to consider that to and to find ways to do that. But again, I would just emphasize, if we're going to do that, we need the resources uh, in order to do it. And we need the skilled team of people that can bring people together, be those connectors. And, you know, touching on some comments that have also been made, are able to, to hold and facilitate the spaces that enable those conversations to happen in a way where people feel like they're able to have their voices heard and we can build that kind of trust and consensus behind um, how this needs to, uh, to move forward. But Tala and Fiona might have some specific thoughts on the recommendations in response to Paul. Tala? Uh, uh, yes, sure, I can, I, I can come in there. Thank you, Kelly, um, and thank you um, for the question. Um, I, I think the, the, the way in which the recommendations have been written out, it talks about foundation areas, the current parliament and long-term ambitions. It's giving the timeline there, really. Um, and from, from my perspective, uh, the, the pressing issue is coherence, across government and parliament in, in, in making sure that this, my, can, I, I would never want this to be pursued as an add-on in places where it feels easy to pursue deliberative democracy. Um, the, the, it is really about it being coherently across uh, government in different areas, giving access to influence decisions and have a stake in decisions across the board. So, so from my perspective, certainly, the foundations of bringing people together, and that includes those who are the under 16s, um, the um, local government coming together and understanding what the impact um, will be for them and what, what good design and delivery would look like for them it is critical. And um, equally, the coherence is linked to that centre of, of, of expertise within the Scottish Government and the um, creation of a national participation strategy, which again, the Royal Society of Edinburgh have also called for. All of these things, I think, um, are, are, are written out in the current Parliament um, uh, timeline of over the next few years, because that creates the foundation of good implementation and will provide us with an idea of resourcing that is required to enable this to go forward. So the prioritisation for me is getting people from different areas of public life in Scotland involved um, the creation of the participation strategy and centre of expertise is what will enable this to be done well. Thank you. And Fiona? Yeah, I, I won't add too much to what's been said already. I think one of the, the, the other pressing issues, as well as starting to develop that coherence and put in place a participation unit, is to also maintain momentum in terms of actual delivery of these deliberative processes to you know, young people's citizens assembly and so on. And one of the, the, the constraints, I guess, with setting up a unit within government is perceptions about its, ind its independence. Therefore, in the longer term, the ambition of the group was to move towards this na national participation centre, which will would have full independence of government and you know, be one of those democratic institutions. Paul Sweeney? Much for those, for those answers. I, I suppose just to sort of try and establish an example or a particular instance where there could be more rapid movement. Um, I noted yesterday, for example, there was a committee debate on the national planning framework, uh, the new fourth national planning framework, for example, and, and it was mentioned earlier in the discussion about planning being a particular area where 
Often public engagement can be in the context of a hostile or, or perceived threat. Um, so, has there been any specific, for example, in the case of MPF4, has there been any specific consideration of actions this Parliament could take, perhaps through this committee or other committees, to advance the agenda uh, of, of a citizens' assembly or that type of deliberative democracy approach in reforming the planning system, for example? Is that, is that a, a particular case that could be something that this, this committee might take cognizance of? Kelly, who will handle that? Yeah, I mean, briefly, I, I, and I think Fiona would come in here, I would say, uh, yes, I think there is huge opportunity within the planning system to involve people in a more deliberative way. And I think there are some interesting models that you can explore, and I don't want to stray too far into design, that think about how you have deliberations at the local level and then connect them uh, to conversations that um, work on a more kind of representative model, bringing people together across the country to look at perhaps national uh, approaches to and strategies around planning. But I don't want to stray too far into design. So, Fiona, I know that you raised this, and I'll, I'll hand over to you. Fiona. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be a perfect area to, to use a, a method like this in terms of looking at how the, the national planning framework can operate to be able to, to include community interests as well as developers. And I think it's also critical because at the moment we've got the requirement or we've got the, the local place plans, which are a feature of the, the national planning framework, which again is an opportunity for people to get involved, but may just be an opportunity for those who are most able and who are most motivated to, um, to get involved in the planning system because it's notoriously tricky for people to navigate. So from that point of view, I think looking at the, the, the context of local place plans in terms of how they're accessible, how they, they, they manage to... to, to um, reflect the voices of marginalised groups and the needs of marginalised groups is, is critically important within the planning system. So a, a function like this could assist with that. Okay. Paul Sweeney? Indicative sort of set of practical opportunities that we, we might be able to pursue. Um, I know it was touched on that you, you didn't want to sort of uh, jump the gun in terms of like what resourcing might look like, but has there been any sort of indicative costings of resources necessary to support the work that you're, you're proposing. Um. Yeah, I, I understand that uh, Scottish Government colleagues were going to take that forward as a task, so I haven't got any uh, concrete information really to share today. Oh, oh, with no that, problem. Uh, and just to, oh, sorry. No, no, uh, uh, Paul, off, over to you. I was going to say that almost led me into Fergus Ewing and the next steps, but uh, go ahead. No, it was just if there was any final um, points, any, any of the um, members of the panel wanted to make in relation to what implications there are for the Parliament in this report, anything that we should very specifically latch on to take forward as, as a committee. Um. Kelly? Yeah, I mean, generally, I hope you get the sense from this report that there is huge opportunity. And I know, you know, specifically, as I've already mentioned, we haven't said too much around the Parliament because we wanted to, to respect the role that the Parliament has. Um, but we certainly think, you know, longer term, there is a role for the Parliament uh, in some of the scrutiny work, and we have mentioned that in the report. Um, but otherwise, you know, I, I think we're just very interested uh, and very eager as a group to understand what the next steps are um, from the Scottish Government and particularly any plans around how some of the at least early ideas can be resourced, knowing that that is really um, intended to set us up for all of the actions and the recommendations that are to follow over the other two uh, time buckets that are there. So I think as a group, you know, as a question at least that I have, um, I'd be very interested to, to know the response to that um, when the time comes. And I'm very aware that you have a, a meeting with the Minister coming up in June. Uh, Fiona, you were keen to come in here as well. Yes, please. Thanks. Um, I think it's, it would be really helpful for the Parliament to help cohere a lot of the different initiatives that are around participatory and deliberative democracy. Just now, as we spoke about earlier, there's also the review of the local governance, the local governance review that, that's uh, going to be entering a second phase, and also the review of the Community Impairment Scotland Act, as well as the work of the RSA that Talent mentioned and so on. So, I mean, participatory democracy is kind of everybody's business, but it's helpful to have a kind of coherence across parliament, across government, around all of those initiatives and how they can become, you know, uh, greater than the sum of all their parts. Okay, and, and finally, Talat, you wanted to contribute uh, on this section as well. Yes, just very quickly. Um, the role, I think, of, of this committee of parliament is about scrutiny of this being done well. So, I've already um, explained previously that. There's a greater risk in not pursuing deliberative democracy measures and not pursuing this work, and um, an equal risk of 
pursuing it badly. So from my my perspective, I think it is the role of, of Parliament, I think it, it, there is a role for this committee to scrutinise it being delivered well, it being delivered with the resources that are required and, and creating some accountability around that. And secondly, the ensuring that the delivery is focused on marginalised communities having better access to decision making and influence. What I would not want to see is a pursuit of um, a, a, a kind of um, simplified or superficial um, version of this, which gives another route of influence, another route of participation for those who already have access to uh, influence and participation. So there is a role, I believe, for this committee, for others, for Parliament to scrutinise the, the, the ability of this work to reach out to the furthest and most marginalised communities in Scotland. Um, I think that's essential. Thank you very much. And if, if colleagues are content, we're coming towards the end of our time uh, now. So I'd like to ask Fergus Ewing to move into the final section, which is really the next steps and, and the government reaction. Fergus. Well, thank you, convener, and good morning to the witnesses, and thank you for the work that you've you've carried out. Um, I wanted to ask about next steps and government and other reaction, and really two two questions, convener, for each of the the witnesses in turn. Um, first of all, whether the group has had any initial reaction to its recommendations from the Scottish government, or indeed from from anyone else, um, and if so, what does that reaction been? And secondly, whether the group can set out what the next steps are for the work um, that it, that it is is done, but also the next steps for the group itself. Kelly. Hi, I will give a response as best I can, uh, although I may not um, have all the information about some of the next steps that are planned um, for the Scottish Government. Uh, so, I mean, the first thing to say is that, you know, this work um, and the recommendations that we've made, we really appreciate are challenging and they require elements of um, changing culture and that can be a difficult task. So, you know, we're delighted that the Parliament and COSLA, for example, were able to join the group and I think it's important just to note that. Um, so in terms of reaction, members of the group did meet with um, George Adam and Patrick Harvey in February to present the draft recommendations, and we had a fantastic discussion in that setting, uh, although we haven't received any kind of formal written response or anything like that that I am currently aware of, um, and I'm not sure if that is currently planned, but we are again aware that there is a meeting planned with this committee um, and the Minister in June, so we'll be watching that with interest and to, to see any outcomes from that meeting. Um, I'm aware that the report has resource implications and that, you know, costing the delivery of those recommendations is a task for the Scottish Government. It's not something that the group was asked to do, um, but we hope that ministers will make the necessary commitments so that the ambition for participatory and deliberative democracy can be realised. So in terms of next steps, uh, I will certainly be looking out for that. And I would also be looking out, you know, this, this work absolutely needs people with the knowledge and skills to be a driving force and to support colleagues across the civil society, uh, across the civil service and indeed other partners in Scotland uh, and across the system to deliver the ambition that we set out in this report. And I think the ambition that is now becoming expected from all of the different um, areas and, and reports that have been published to this effect over recent years that Talat touched on earlier. Um, so I'd absolutely urge members to support those efforts to, to build that capacity and to assure efficient and effective delivery of these recommendations. And I also hope that other actors across the system will be proactively engaged and given the opportunity to shape these plans uh, so that we're progressing democracy across Scotland as Scotland. And I think that does need coordination. Um, so I'd emphasise again the point of dedicated resource. Um, in terms of next steps for us, I mean, I, I will say that there is absolutely continued interest in the next steps for these recommendations and seeing a plan for how they may be delivered. And uh, members of the working group would absolutely like to be kept informed of the progress at the very least and any opportunities to be further involved uh, with these recommendations and ensuring that they do become actions, I think we'd be very keen to hear. So uh, in terms of, of next steps, I think we're very much um, waiting for further opportunities to be involved as a group. But I know that some work will be ongoing in Scottish Government at the moment, but I'm not best placed uh, to answer that. And I, I think as a group as well, we also welcome any follow-up questions that might aid the work of this committee. Thank you very much. And I'll come to each of uh, our other two witnesses in turn. Just mindful of the time, but uh, Talat, would you like to comment? 
further? Or has uh, Kelly kind of summed things up? No, it, it, Kelly has certainly summed things up. Um, I want to take up a more time. Fiona, is there anything you'd like to add? Fergus, coming back to you, is there anything you'd like to Hello. add further to that? Um, <clears throat> well, I wonder whether, whether Kelly and the other witnesses think that an essential ingredient to something happening as opposed to you know, not much happening or or the momentum being lost that it's essential that one witness, uh, one minister, I'm sorry, in the Scottish Government drive this forward. And that also, you know, there'll be a clear lead civil servant official also driving it forward so that there is someone who, if you like, will deliver momentum, but also someone with whom the buck will stop. I mean, briefly, I would certainly welcome that. I think that civil servant will need a skilled and experienced team to help them. But yeah, I think that's a good starting point personally. Fiona, you would like to comment on that? Yes, I, I do think it's critical to maintain momentum. I think what we tend to do quite a lot of the time is try something, do it once. Everybody thinks it's good. We generate a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of discussion and a lot of plans around it. And then the plans take a long time to come out with something <laughs> With something else going to later on down the line. In terms of the, this topic, public participation, it's really critical that we continue to operate, you know, some, some public participation processes and make sure that we're actually building awareness of citizens of those processes and the developments that are taking place and being shaped up at national level. So I think it's a really important step. Thank you. Fergus. Um, just, just one final thought. You know, I, I wonder if the point I think it was uh, Talat made about reaching those that are not normally taking part in, in any liaison contact participation in democracy of the Scottish Government or anybody else in public life, if the, the really the, the duty rests on government ministers and indeed MSPs to go out and meet those people and be proactive in getting out there and going to visit people, particularly once COVID is over and we can get back into in very commas, normal life in very commas, and that really again the buck rests with ministers in particular, but MSPs and um, elected people, councillors, and so on in general. And if that is not something that should be the primary driver of this, on the basis that we have individual personal responsibility in whatever capacity we have in public life to try to reach out to those who are disadvantaged, underrepresented, and uninvolved. Any final thoughts? Uh, so, uh, thank you. Yes. So I, I think um, that is the basis of a strong um, and accessible representative democracy. And I would certainly hope that is something that MSPs take very seriously. And it needs to, there, more of it needs to happen. Certainly, access to them as MSPs, to their constituents, and um, to uh, Parliament is, is hugely important. But it, but it is different from what we're talking about here when we talk about deliberative democracy and particular systems and processes that are created to enable um, conversations about issues related to um, health or poverty, climate justice, transport, whatever it might be. Um, it's also important that it's not transactional, which is, you know, um, MSPs asking a question, um, for example, surgeries within constituencies that MS MSPs pursue. It's Part of deliberative democracy is also an opportunity for it to be explorative around issues, um, like Fiona was saying, not simply when something goes wrong and you're responding to it. So I, I believe that going out and the, the buck stopping with MSPs on um, marginalised communities having access to representative democracy is hugely important and a cornerstone of competent democracy. But it is actually um, parallel to, adjacent to, the deliberative democracy measures. Um, both are required, both require focus on marginalised communities, and they come together to create a strong and competent democracy, um, but they, they exist as, as two separate things, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank on you. that note, thank I think I'm going to draw our uh, session to an end. I'd like really to thank uh, Kelly McBride, Fiona Garvin and Talat Yacoub, really, for their very comprehensive and helpful answers. I think that's been a very useful discussion and has very much complemented, I think, the evidence session we've previously had. So thank you all very much uh, for your contribution and your participation today. And on that note, I'm going to suspend the meeting for a few moments. Thank you.
Um, welcome back. And to this uh, is now our third item today, which is to consider uh, some continued petitions, the first of which is petition PE 1723, which is essential tremor treatment in Scotland. And this was lodged by Mary Ramsey uh, and was last considered by us on the uh, 19th of January. It calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to raise awareness of essential tremor and to support the introduction and use of a focus ultrasound scanner for treating people in Scotland. Uh, Rhoda Grant will be joining us again, but before I invite Rhoda to speak, just to say that in the uh, last consideration we agreed to write to both the Scottish Government and the uh, National Services Division. Uh, we've had a response from the Scottish Government which indicated that the National Services Division is expected to resume applications for the commissioning of new services this month, and th that, I think, was roughly the timetable that was being uh, suggested when we last considered the petition. Uh, it, the National Services Division continues to engage with the clinical team in Tayside to understand what would be required to provide focus and ultrasound in Scotland, um, should there be a decision taken that that would be the preferred route. Uh, the submission informs us the Scottish Government is not yet committed to funding an MRG FUS service in 22-23, and that the evidence base will inform considerations about this future investment. Uh, Scottish Government also provided information about its work to raise awareness of essential tremor amongst patients and healthcare professionals, and the petitioner's most recent submission um, highlights that there are in fact 100,000 people in Scotland with essential tremor, a figure which suggests, uh, she suggests does not include those waiting to see specialists or those who have been misdiagnosed. Uh, Rhoda, you, you are with us. Uh, is there anything, I mean, we're, we're not necessarily taking a lot of additional evidence today because we are waiting now to hear um, what progress can be made, but is there anything you would like to contribute uh, to our further understanding? Um, just a very quick comment, convener. I think I'm reasonably disappointed with the Scottish Government response and that it just goes over what they had said before. There's not an awful lot of difference there. Um, and I also note that the National Services Division have not responded themselves, but they did see that they were working with in um, NHST side um, and were due to meet them at the end of January at the last when we had the last meeting. Mm -hmm. And they might be in a position to look at a formal application in either May or June of this year. So I think it would be important maybe to keep this petition open um, so that we can see what conclusion is reached by the National Services Division. Um, certainly, you know, towards the summer of this year. And I think Mary has pointed out the number of people affected by this condition. It's really important that we make some progress. And I think just to reiterate as well that Mary Ramsey has stated that she would be happy to give further evidence to the committee if they wished. And Ian Sharp, who has benefited from focused ultrasound treatment, has also made that offer. So really just to encourage the committee to keep the petition open and to keep scrutinising this issue in the hope that we make some progress. Yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, Rhoda Grant. I mean, I very much believe that we will keep the petition open. We are really still awaiting some of the key information that I think we felt would be uh, critical to our coming to a further determination. Uh, would any colleagues like to make any further recommendations? David Torrance? Thank you, Convener. I would like to recommend that we keep the petition open and in doing so, can the committee write to the National Specialist Service Committee to highlight the evidence received by the committee on essential tremor treatment and recommend that any application of the rollout of MRG FUS across Scotland is given early consideration when the application of process opens in April 2022 and in writing to the National Service Division, the committee could ask for further details of the decision-making process and timescales for the next steps should an application be successful, successful. And to write to the Scottish Government to highlight the committee's engagement with the National Specialist Service Committee and to ask the Scottish Government whether it will commit to a public awareness campaign should any application prove successful. And in doing so, I would ask it in writing to the Scottish Government, the committee may all ask I also wish to ask for further information about the National Professional Patient and Public Reference Group, including its role, remit and membership. Thank you very much, uh, David Torrance. Uh, uh, any other recommendations? Colleagues content? I should say in passing that, I mean, I, and just to Rhoda Grant to reassure her, I think we were given to understand that the National Services Division and the, the Scottish Government coordinated the response that we received. So I understand that uh, there was input into that, albeit we didn't receive uh, something separately. Uh, colleagues content that we keep the petition open and we write to see 
just whether we can expedite some of the information that I think we're looking to receive. We are, and I lost sight of my other two colleagues, but I assume they're in agreement as well. Thank you. Um, we move then to petition number 1859 to retain falconers' rights to practice upland falconry in Scotland, uh, lodged by um, Barry Blyther. Um, it was last considered by us on the 1st of December and calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to amend the Animals and Wildlife Penalties, Protections and Powers Scotland Act of 2020 to allow mountain hares to be hunted for the purposes of falconry. At that meeting um, in December, we really agreed to write to the Scottish Government to seek its views on how it expects captive falcons to differentiate between legal and illegal species. We did think the whole thing sounded a bit... Um, well, difficult to follow through. And for example, how you know a bird of prey is supposed to tell the difference between a rabbit or a mountain hare when it's exhibiting its natural behaviours. The committee also asked the Scottish Government to clarify when falconers would face prosecution should their bird take a mountain hare, including what the penalties might be for a breach and how the current legislation is enforced. Now, the Scottish Government's response states that it is the responsibility of the falconer to eliminate or at least significantly reduce risk by only undertaking falconry where mountain hare are unlikely to be present. And uh, here I I'm, feel I felt that we had verged on the slightly ridiculous in that it then transpired that the government's definition of where mountain hare is unlikely to be present uh, amounts to some 2.5% of Scotland with 97.5% of the of the landscape allegedly being um well I'm not saying riddled with mountain hares but certainly with mountain hares present um to the point where I almost felt the Scottish government were advocating that falcons should be trained in the use of sat nav because they were to apparently understand that the M8 the Hart Hill service stations uh, Aberdeen and points towards the coast were where they would be able to go about their business. Um, so, I mean, all of that struck me as being slightly removed from the, um, uh, the, 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 the reality and kind of played to the questions that we were considering. The final submission from the petitioner focuses on the role of falconry and pest control, pointing out that there is an exemption for falconry so that gulls can be deterred even though they carry the same level of protections as mountain hare. And the Scottish Government submission notes that Police Scotland are responsible for enforcing legislation and that penalties for wildlife crime vary depending on what offence has been committed. Um, Fergus Ewing, I know you're quite keen to, to contribute to, to uh, this particular item in the first instance. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Convener, and I would endorse the comments that you've made entirely. Um, I, I do think that falconry, albeit not a huge area of life in Scotland, is nonetheless an important part of rural life and the rural economy, and that lots of things that falconers do um, are valuable and of real worth to society. And I just wanted very briefly to say that, um, you know, I've seen myself falconers teach children about birds of prey at agricultural shows, at game fairs like at Moy and Schoon, and they also take birds into school. So children learn about birds of prey directly and probably primarily or even solely from falconers. Also, in speaking to a leading falconer, not the petitioner, but another one over the weekend, I know that they also rehabilitate birds. They make them better. And that surely is something that should be recognised. Um, and they also play a part in control of pests, such as, as gulls, overpopulation of gulls, as, as has been mentioned. Um, and they are part of the, the rural tapestry convener. And I just say that because I was very disappointed when I noticed the response of the Scottish Government, the first one, um, back last year, when they didn't actually value falconry, they just said they recognised the history and culture. I thought that was very disappointing. Turning to where we go from now, convener, I'm bound to reflect that when the ban on mountain hare culling was introduced in 2020, um, the Verity report, which preceded it, did not consider falconry at all. Um, as far as I know, no one mentioned falconry in the stage three debate, where um, which was the first time where the proposed ban was introduced. And therefore, falconers are, I think, in a unique situation, convener, in my 22 years in this parliament. They not only have not had a fair hearing about their activity being banned, they've had no hearing whatsoever. They have been completely ignored. And that does seem to me to be redolent of the grim world that was created by the author 
Franz Kafka, where people are banned from doing their occupant their their preferred occupation without any a opportunity to be heard and have that fair hearing that is the first principle of natural justice, Audi Alter and Partem. So where do we go from here? I mean, I would suggest um, that there should be oral evidence that the petitioner should have an opportunity to be heard and to put forward the very strong arguments, I thought, that the activities of falconers only account for a very small proportion of mountain hares that are taken. I think 1,000 Dr. Nick Fox said in his supplementary submission that we've just just received, uh, and certainly a fraction of those taken by shooting. Um, so I, I think the petitioner should be heard, and I, I would recommend that Dr. Nick Fox also accompany him if he so wishes, so that the petitioner is not alone, and that we also hear from Nature Scott, who have licensing powers, which could be part of the solution. Uh, and as as well as that, um, convener, we hear from the Scottish government. Uh, I know that that this committee is time constrained, but I do think particularly in the fact that this is a group in society that has not had any hearing whatsoever from the Scottish Parliament, that the purpose of this committee, if you like, is to allow David to take on Goliath, and our particular role is to equip David with a sling. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Mr Ewing. Um, I, and I very much concur with the um, recommended route, and I wonder if colleagues do as well. I mean, uh, when I read the Scottish Government's response, I too was slightly disappointed. I had hoped that, um, given the circumstances and the fact that this had really emerged out of a Stage 3 amendment, that there might have been a route through um, discussion uh, with the government that would have led to some sort of resolution. But I, I did feel that, that it was rather a disdainful brush off to the issue that we are trying to explore, um, and that taking evidence does seem to be a reasonable course of action. Uh, do, are colleagues content that we proceed on the basis that Mr Ewing has agreed? And it might be useful as well just to write to the Game and Wildlife Conserv Conservation Trust and the RSPCB just to obtain their wider concern about the impact that this would have in relation to conservation. Are we content with that? We are. Thank you very much. Uh, that moves us then to uh, petition number 1877, which is to provide body cameras for all frontline NHS staff, uh, lodged by uh, Alex Wallace, and last considered by us uh, on the 19th of January. We agreed then to write to the Scottish Ambulance Service and the Scottish Government uh, to find out more about the body camera trial that we understood was underway. Uh, I understand from the responses received that the trial is still in the scoping and planning phase due to the extreme pressures being experienced due to the pandemic. Um, Scottish Ambulance Service listed the ways in which it intends to evaluate the technology and stated that the timescale for initial evaluation will now be towards the end of the year. Uh, I mean, I think given that we've already undertaken to um, await the outcome of this uh, evaluation, that would seem a sensible way forward. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Camilla. Yes, I, I, I acknowledge the fact that the pandemic has had a knock-on effect on this whole process. Uh, but I do believe that if we wait until we have had uh, the, the pilot evaluation, uh, would be would be the most sensible way to go forward, uh, and that would give us the opportunity at that point to then write to and can continue to communicate with the, the Scottish Ambulance Service on on how that that ha has happened and what outcomes have, have have taken from the pilot and the evaluation for the next steps. So I do think we continue with that and just see how we progress uh, in the time skills that the, the 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 sector and the ambulance service have 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 indicated to us. Thank you. I mean, it does mean rather a lot extended time um, that we have to place before we're able to consider the petition uh, in, in any informed way, but I think that's probably the right course of action. Are colleagues content with that suggestion? We are. Um, petition number 1902, to allow an appeal process for community participation requests, lodged by Maria Aitken on behalf of the Kithness Health Action Team. Um, we're joined again by Rhoda Grant, who we'll come to in just a moment. It calls on the, par the Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to allow an appeal process for community participation requests under the Community Empowerment Act, Scotland 2015. Um, we considered this last on the 17th of November last year um, and agreed to write to the Scottish Community Development Centre to ask about the work it was carrying out to explore options for an appeal process. We've now had a response indicating that a working group has been set up 
Uh, it comprises of people and organisations with a particular interest in participation requests. And I understand that the group was due to meet um, sometime between when we last considered the petition and this month. Uh, Rhoda Grant, is there anything you would like to... Are you still... Oh, we've, lost, we've, lost, <laughs> we've lost Rhoda Grant, so uh, we can't hear from Rhoda. But again, I think we are probably wanting to chase up any uh, recommendations? Any colleagues like to come forward with the rec David Torrens? I, you know, I think we should really chase up um, the Scottish Community Development Centre to seek an update on the working group's consideration of potential models for an appeals process and to ask specifically when it plans to report to the Scottish Government if that report will include recommendations on the introduction of an appeals process and what further engagement it anticipates with communities on this issue. Our colleagues content to keep the petition open on the basis just suggested and take the actions we are. Uh, petition number 1914, the banning of school uniforms in secondary schools, uh, lodged by Matthew Lewis Simpson, uh, which calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to remove the requirement for school uniforms for older school pupils. Uh, and the petitioner cites a range of reasons for bringing forward the petition, including uniform costs for low-income families, pupil choice, and the need for comfortable and weather appropriate clothing options. Again, this was last considered on the 19th of January, and at that time we agreed to write to the Scottish Government, the Children and Young People's Commission of Scotland, the National Parent Forum of Scotland, the Scottish Youth Parliament. Um, at that last uh, consideration, we also heard from the Scottish Government that it was in the process of committing to update its school uniform guidance and that a public consultation uh, in relation to that was imminent. We've now received responses from the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills and all the other stakeholders we contacted, including the Scottish Youth Parliament, who were, I think, unable themselves to come to a determination on the issue, which I thought was interesting. Um, I think at this stage we probably do wish to keep the petition open, particularly pending this consultation the Scottish Government is about to undertake and we now believe was likely to be during the course of the summer. Um, are there any other comments or recommendations colleagues would like to make? Alexander Stewart? Yep. Convener, yes, I, I, I once again would concur that we do uh, keep the petition open. Uh, and yes, we have had the information back from the Scottish Government about, about the consultation. But in during this consultation, it's very important uh, that we highlight the, the evidence that's been received. And we also ensure uh, and we seek assurances that children and young people will be fully involved in the consultation process, uh, including the, the co-design of the, the consultation itself, to ensure that they, they do have uh, that willingness to be uh, participative. Uh, and as we discussed in the past, uh, that the identification and identity of, of a school uniform uh, sometimes has a, a focus, but uh, these young people have a right to have the opportunity to express their views. And if they can do that through the consultation, uh, we may then receive more information that may help us uh, make a decision. Thank you for that. Uh, our colleagues agreed to, to keep the petition open and to proceed on the basis that we've just discussed. We are. Uh, uh, petition number 1916, uh, request a public inquiry into the management of the Rest and Be Thankful project, uh, lodged by uh, councillors Douglas Fillon and Donald Kelly, uh, which asked the Scottish calls and the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government to instigate a public inquiry regarding the political and financial management of the A83 Rest and Be Thankful project. Uh, this project aims to provide a permanent solution for the route. Again, we last considered this in January, and we agreed to write the Scottish Government to clarify whether it intended to carry out a public inquiry into the management of the project. Um, we've received an update from Transport Scotland and they make the point that the public inquiry would take a protracted period of time and would actually only review all that has been discussed to date but really would not necessarily identify any further solution. Um, I, David Torrance will know and certainly I can recall that this is an area of discussion that this committee has been involved in for a very long time. Um, the public inquiry may only look at everything that's happened to date, uh, but the implication from Transport Scotland of their uh, seeking not to pursue that route is that it would delay them actually being able to take forward a viable project. It's the taking forward of a, or even the identifying of a viable project that really I think is the big overhanging issue in all of this. So I'm un unwilling to close the petition at this point, but that's not necessarily that I don't accept some of the arguments, but I wouldn't want to rule out a public inquiry 
if Transport Scotland and the Scottish Government are unable to actually move this project forward in some way. And so I would think, you know, I would like to suggest that we go back to um, the Transport Scotland, uh, making clear that implicit in the evidence that we the submission we received from them is an intention to do something um, and that we will consider afresh whether a public inquiry is necessary, contingent on whether there is actually any progress on the issue. Are we content with that? David Torrance. A convener, I would agree with that, um, like yourself, I think, and, oh, God, two sessions ago now, we have been to rest and thankful to see the progress that's been made. Um, but, like yourself, I wouldn't like to see a petition closed, so I'll go with your recommendations. Uh, so, while not necessarily not accepting the public inquiry route, I, I do want to see Transport Scotland take something forward with this, and... I'd rather not close this petition and find that we have yet another one coming later on in time. Um, is Fergus Ewing, you'd like to contribute? Just to support what David Torrance and yourself have said, convener, and just to make the point, as I think we all know, that for the people that are served by the rest to be thankful, this really is the is is a hugely important matter. So I entirely agree with the conditional approach that you're taking, and it would be very useful to get a much clearer idea from Transport Scotland and the Minister about timescales, about when a viable proposal will be forthcoming, and indeed what has prevented the bringing forward of viable proposals, because this has been going on for a very, very long time, far too long for the people on the peninsula served by the road. Thank you very much. Uh, in which case, I take it, colleagues, we are agreed, and we will proceed on that basis. Uh, that brings us to item four, which is the consideration of two new petitions. Um, the first of these, uh, I, I know, I, and as I always qualify when we enter into the consideration of new petitions, for those who might be joining us to see us consider their petition, to say that we, in the first instance, do forward the petition to the Scottish Government in order that we can get some preliminary views uh, which help inform our consideration of the petition here as a committee. Uh, the first petition is petition number 1926, which is to expand universal free school meals for all nursery, primary and secondary school pupils. Uh, and it has been brought forward by Alison Dowling. Uh, Alison has lodged the petition as she believes urgent action is needed at a national level to address food poverty for children and young people in Scotland. She suggests that food poverty is sometimes hidden within schools, particularly among secondary school age pupils. And she notes that whilst there is an extension of free school meals planned for younger pupils, there are currently no plans in place for older secondary school age pupils. Uh, the Scottish Government indicates in its submission to the committee that its present focus is on expanding those free school meals in primary schools. However, it also notes that during the course of this parliamentary session, we are also committed to piloting approaches to universal meal provision in secondary schools. Uh, so I wonder whether members have any comments or suggestions as to how we might take this petition forward. We, I'm not sure we lost, <laughs> my screen's gone blank. We've lost Paul Sweeney. Uh, colleague David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. I would like to keep the petition open, um, and in doing so, I would like to, like to write to several stakeholders. I think this is a really important area that needs to be looked into. And um, these stakeholders would include Child Poverty Action Group, Children and Young People's Commissioner Scotland, COSLA, the Community Food and Health Scotland organisation, who works with inequalities and barriers to health and affordable food, and the Trussell Trust. I'd also like to write to the Scottish Government because like, everything has a cost, so I'd like to see what investment would be needed to make this possible in all the nurseries, primary schools and secondary schools across Scotland. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, much uh, David Torrance. Fergus Ewing. No, I, I didn't have any comment on this, Convener. Oh, right, thank you. So, a misstep in our communications. Paul Sweeney, is there anything you'd like to add? You know, I think. Um, uh, oh, thank you, convener. Um, I think there's definitely a, a merit in this from a social justice point of view, and, and to create this as a universal public good. Um, I think also what's worth considering is it's often talked about in terms of the cost of infrastructure, the cost of provision, but 
there's increasingly uh, you know, advances in community food, growing community food provision. So perhaps it needs to be considered in a wider context about how the community's food resilience is, is actually undertaken. So there's an interesting project in Glasgow, for example, where uh, community food social enterprise, Loka Bori, have actually taken over part of public parks to start growing produce, and it can be sold uh, both commercially but also used for food justice projects, you know, food pantry networks, etc. You know, this could all be part of the picture. You know, so perhaps there's a bigger piece of work to be done there about how we actually improve the, the supply, if you like, of, of food in the local community. And this could be part of this exercise as well. It could be, you know, a broader public good than just simply the, the, the mechanical exercise of providing catering for, for schools. You know. Thank you for that. Um, I, and I'm quite happy to in, incorporate that into the request for information that we may be seeking to obtain from some of the, or, well, from the organisations identified there by uh, David Torrens. Um, I'm, uh, on that basis, we are happy to keep the petition open and to take forward the gathering of information as was suggested a moment ago. Uh, colleagues content? We are. Um, our final uh, petition this morning is the new petition 1928, which is to provide free rail travel for disabled people who meet the qualifications for free bus travel. Um, and this is lodged by David Gallant and uh, David notes that many disabled people who qualify for pre-bus travel are unable to benefit from it due to the withdrawal of rural bus services and the lack of access to suitable toilet facilities on many of the buses that actually operate still within rural, rural areas. Uh, he also points out that train for fares are unaffordable, so train travel is not currently a viable alternative in these areas. Uh, we've received a submission from Site Scotland highlighting the need for consistent national policy for rail travel across Scotland, which entitles blind and partially sighted people and their companions to free rail travel. Site Scotland points out that there are currently different concessionary and companion schemes in different areas, potentially causing confusion to passengers and rail staff. Uh, Transport Scotland has also sent us a submission, and I should state this was drafted prior to Scotland Rail's move to public ownership. Uh, but it indicates that ScotRail has no plans to introduce free travel for disabled people, whilst pointing out that uh, ScotRail offers discounted fares through the Disabled Persons Rail Card and that there is free travel for blind passengers via a scheme operated by local authorities. Uh, Transport Scotland also highlights a planned fare fares review to ensure a sustainable and integrated approach to public transport fares in the future suggesting that existing discounts and concessionary schemes across a range of transport will be considered as part of this review. Now, this is an interesting new petition, and I wonder if uh, colleagues have got any comments they would like to make. Anything? Um, David Torrance. Thank you, Kavida. Um, I would like to keep the petition open, and I wonder if we could ask if an evidence session with a petitioner and cite Scotland at a future meeting. Alexander Stewart. I, I, I would concur with that, convener. I think it's, it's very, very important because, as you've identified, uh, there seems to be a bit of a, a mix match uh, across uh, certain regions and areas uh, when it comes to uh, individuals who have a disability uh, and them uh, getting uh, travel and, and support. Uh, and I think it's also uh, we would write to the, the Transport uh, Scotland uh, to request an update of what you indicated, their fair fares review. Uh, because I think that's important uh, to ensure that uh, there is uh, consideration uh, for uh, disabled people across the piece. Thank you. Any other colleagues wish to contribute, or are we content to proceed on the basis of those recommendations? I think we are. Uh, and on that note, we will now move uh, into private sessions. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. <laughs>